Well, thank you, Dean. And uh, I will reiterate that uh, you know, I came here under the agreement that this would largely be a conversation between you folks and David. I'll chime in when appropriate and so forth. But I really want to hear what David has to say and how he goes about what he does. But uh, I'll sort of break the ice and, uh, with an opening observation or, or question, I guess. But, uh, you know, David, you write about a wide variety of issues and subjects. Um, your columns are, are labeled opinion. I think a lot of people, when they think of an opinion column, they think of a soapbox and somebody standing on it, more or less, and, you know, giving out their personal view on whatever the event is at hand. That's not really what you do. You do a very analytical kind of column uh, based on research and reporting. And I guess I'd like you just to talk a little bit about the value of the research and reporting aspect and how that helps uh, form your columns and your arguments. Yeah, I had a friend named Charles Krauthammer who was a columnist for the Washington Post, and he was stupendously brilliant. Uh, and so if you were driving with him, he was driving, and you could say, okay, I'm going to repeat 19 numbers I'd like you to repeat them back to me backwards. Now, the average human being can do about five or six. He could do 19. And so he's just a tremendously brilliant mind. And he, was, he could write a column just by sitting in a room and thinking. Uh, I've never met too many other people who could do that. And so I need to have facts that, I can, that interest me and that I could share around. When I was first given this job in 2003, I got a good piece of advice from a guy named Robert Novak. You may remember, a yeah. conservative columnist. He said, interview three politicians every day. And for about 10 or 15 years, I did that. I would go to the Senate or go to the White House, uh, governor, mayor, and I would interview politicians just to get the inside, sometimes off the record, sometimes on, just so I would have new information I could share with people. And I learned from this experience that politicians are all emotional freaks of one sort or another. Uh, they, I noticed that they would invade your personal space. They would stand too close to you. They would massage your shoulders. They would put their hand on the back of your head and they'd talk to you, including very much our current president, by the way. Uh, and they were just like in your face because they were good at making human connection. And so I did that for a while. I got a little bored with politics because Policy just wasn't making as much difference as it used to. I go up to the Senate, and a lot of the senators I know, their job is not to pass legislation, it's to get on Fox News. <laughs> so they're basically trying to enter my business, so screw them. Uh, why pay attention? So I've gotten much more into the cognitive sciences. I went through a period where I was doing a lot of, uh, and I still do a lot of sociology. And so I have one skill. I, I have a friend who hires people uh, and he hires for two things. First, spirit of generosity. He wants to make sure everybody he hires has a spirit of generosity, something that is not a criteria at the New York Times, by the way. Uh, <laughs> second, a very specific skill. And by when he says specific skill, he doesn't mean I like to teach. He wants to know what part of teaching do you like. And so it could be I like lesson plans or I like remedial education. I have one skill in life. Synthesis. You can give me a mass of information, and I can synthesize it into one point. And so I'm not the most brilliant guy who can come up with brilliant new philosophies. But if you give me a mass of data, I'll make a point out of it. And so that's basically what I do. Well, and I've got another question, but really, anytime, don't, you know, feel free to throw up your hand and we'll call on you. So don't be bashful, but uh, you know, I mentioned about the wide array of subjects you, you deal with, and just in recent weeks, you've dealt with the, uh, democracy on the brink, um, fame through the prism of the Beatles, and uh, Americans seemingly increasingly behaving badly. I, the question is, how do you arrive at what subject matter you're going to write about? Do you have a certain process, or yeah. what? So how many times a week do you write? Three. Oh, you poor bastard. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> it, it, keeps, it keeps, keeps me on my toes and certainly out of trouble. So I used, to, I used to do two a week. Now I do once a week, but I also write for The Atlantic and other places. So I'm basically writing every day. Uh, and so I used to have a lot of human drives, like normal human drives for friendship, hunger, thirst, sex. Now I just have one drive for column ideas. Uh, I, I used to think... Uh, well, if I won the lottery, I didn't care about the money, but oh, I could get a column out of that. Uh, 
If I got hit by a bus and survived, I could get a column out of that. And so the, the famous saying among columnists, which you probably heard, it's like being married to a nymphomaniac. It seems fun for the first two weeks, uh, and then it's just too demanding. Uh, and so I am just constantly searching with sheer desperation for something interesting. Mm -hmm. And so a friend of mine sent me something about how the Beatles made it. And the Beatles like to tell the story, we were just so talented, we made it. But in 1961, the record labels all turned them down, the nightclubs all turned them down. They needed a band of hardcore supporters who made it for them. There was a guy named Brian Epstein, a 27-year-old agent, who bought 10,000 copies of their first single to make it a hit. So it was about how we don't need, if we're con creating culture, it's not only the artists who do it, we do it as audience members. So it's, it's, that's just a point that interested me. And uh, then, so last column was about, you know, Ukraine is now in the news. I happened to cover the independence of Ukraine in the 90s and was there when it, when it seemed like a golden period when the country was blossoming. And it's turned south for 30 years. The, you know, in those days, I was for the Wall Street Journal, and I covered uh, the Middle East peace process, the end of apartheid, the end of the Soviet Union, German reunification. It was such a hopeful period, and it's all gone south. So that column was just, what happened? Mm. And so a lot of my columns are, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> like, these days, like that earlier column about the, the people behaving badly, like, Hate crimes are at a record level. Suicide is at a record level. Drunk driving is at a record level. People are just behaving badly. What? Why? And so I just call up experts and try to figure out answers. And so my columns generally start with, I don't understand this. Uh, let me figure it out. And that makes it a little more, ch some people start with, I, I, I support a point of view. This backs up my point of view, so I'm going to share it with you. And that's a perfectly legitimate way to write a column. But I have a point of view, but uh, most of my interesting columns are like a question that I spend a week trying to answer. Um, you know, you mentioned about uh, getting ideas and where you get them from. Um, a previous columnist at the Union Tribune, when he started out, he did one of those introductory columns, here I am and so forth. I, I didn't do that, but he had a very funny anecdote that the, the columnist who he's taking over from, he asked for advice, said, don't throw anything away. That was sort of his. <laughs> yeah. But uh, just uh, on, uh, you pretty much touched on it, but I wanted to explore a little more that, uh, is there a theme or a goal you try, try to achieve that kind of is a thread through your columns? Yeah, I think there are four things. Um, I say that without knowing what the four are, but I'll think of it. <laughs> <laughs> One of them, uh, I represent a political tendency in American history. And so, to put it briefly, if there's uh, liberals who believe in using government to expand equality, and conservatives traditionally believe in limited government to expand freedom. I come from a tradition that starts with Alexander Hamilton, who was a Puerto Rican hip hop star from New York. Um, <laughs> and it's limited but energetic government to enhance social mobility. It's using government so poor boys and girls like Hamilton can rise and succeed. And that tradition morphed into what became known as the Whig Party in the early 19th century, and then it morphed into Abraham Lincoln, who was a Whig. And then it followed into Theodore Roosevelt, and then it became liberal republicanism, and then it died. So I'm a Whig, there are six of us left, but I think it's a noble tradition. <laughs> and so Hamilton is one of my heroes. Edmund Burke is another, somebody just handed me one of my favorite books called Reflections on the Revolution in France, and he's a classic conservative meaning he believed the world is really complicated and we should be cautious about how we could change it because we're not that smart. And I was a young lefty as a kid growing up in Greenwich Village in New York, but I was a crime reporter in Chicago and I covered a lot of bad social policy that ended up hurting the people it was designed to help. And I thought, oh, that guy I read in college, Edmund Burke, he had knew something. And the phrase is epistemological modesty. We should be modest about what we could think we should know, can know because the world is super complicated. So I try to represent that point of view. The second thing, I think culture and morals are more important than politics. And I think our country is over-politicized and under-moralized. And so I take moral traditions and moral issues and moral thinkers, and I try to apply them to public issues. And I just think we spend way too much time arguing about this and that little political thing on TV, when the real questions are like, how do you lead a good life? How do you survive moments of grief? 
How do you do forgiveness? Like these are the big questions, and we don't really have a forum in which to address those questions except maybe colleges like this one. So I try to do that. Then I, I think sociology is just tremendously important. We're powerfully influenced by the culture around us. Uh, you know, culture, you know, politics is downstream from culture. Samuel Johnson is one of my heroes, uh, 18th century British essayist. He said, of all the things that human hearts endure, how few are those that kings can cause and cure? That it's our relationships that matter more than politics or what kings can do. And so I try to cover that turf. And so I've worked it up to three. Um, I used to be, and I started out my career as a humor columnist. Uh, and then uh, I did that for a while, and then I got hired at the Times. <laughs> uh, and there was a trouble writing humor at the Times. The first was, I was more conservative than the audience. When I was hired, I was told I was um, as conservative as our readers could stand. And my joke is being a conservative columnist at the New York Times is like being the chief rabbi at Mecca. It's like not a lot of company there, you're all alone. Um, and especially in these polarized times, people will only laugh with people they agree with. And so people, will, progressives will laugh with Trevor Noah and people like that, because they agree with them. And a lot of comedy is just, hey, we agree. <laughs> and so I find I couldn't do that. And then I, I was just, I don't know, I, I got older and I got less funny. Uh, and so some of that youthful cleverness went away. So that would have been my fourth, but it's faded away. <laughs> I'm wondering, were you a, a good writer young, as a younger person, and that took you into journalism, or did journalism craft your writing? Yeah, very good question. I'll probably talk about this with Dean tonight, but uh, when I was seven, I um, read a book called Paddington the Bear, and at that moment decided, I want to do that. At least that's a story I now tell myself. <laughs> I think it's sort of true. It was overdetermined. My parents were literature professors. My grandfather who really raised me was a beautiful writer. He was a lawyer, but he was a beautiful writer. But I knew very early on that I wanted to become a writer. I told the students earlier today that in high school, I wanted to date this woman named Bernice. And she didn't want to date me. She dated another guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. <laughs> and so. That, that doesn't work for you? Yeah. <laughs> People should date the best writers in their school. That's the way it should go. And so then I went to college, uh, and I wrote for the school paper, and I wanted to become a novelist. Uh, and uh, I entered the lucrative field of novel writing upon graduation as a bartender, and I wrote all these stories and sent them off, and I worked at a little literary review. And after about a year of bartending, I got a job as a police reporter. And I came home every day with a story. Like I went out, I covered crime in the south and west sides of Chicago, and every day it was some amazing event that I got to witness. And some, a lot of days it was, I covered incredible stupidity. A lot of people go into crime because they're not the sharpest tools. So I covered a guy who was working at McDonald's, so he did an armed robbery at the McDonald's he worked at. <laughs> they all said, John, we recognize you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I covered a bunch of guys who broke out of jail, got hungry, ate in the window of the restaurant across the street. So they, they, and so when that, these books came out called the Darwin Awards, I don't know if you remember these books. Yeah. I'm really, I should have written that because I had a lot of those stories. Um, and so it, it, just, it was just f exciting to go out. And, and then I had a freakish break in college. I had a humor column and I wrote a vicious parody of a columnist named William F. Buckley uh, for being a name-dropping blowhard. And it was funny. And, you know, it was, had jokes like, at Yale, Buckley formed two magazines, one called the National Buckley, one called the Buckley Review, which he merged to form the Buckley Buckley. Uh, and it was like a bunch of jokes like that. And he liked it. And so he gave a speech to the student body, and he said, David Brooks, if you're in the audience, I want to give you a job. And that was the big break of my life. Now, I wasn't in the audience, naturally. But uh, three years later, I called him up and said, the offer's still open. And so I moved from crime in Chicago to William F. Buckley's Park Avenue penthouse apartment. <laughs> and, but he, I worked at National Review, and he trained me to be an opinion writer. And then one thing led to another. And so it, I, I, I look back, what would have happened if I'd stayed in novel writing? 
I th I'd be a lot poorer, um, but I think I'd be more emotional. I had a, an interesting event. I'm, I'm riffing now, but bear Please with do. me. <laughs> so I'm at some party in New York and having a bunch of random conversations, and I meet a guy who teaches creative writing at Princeton. And he says to me, do you ever drink while you're writing? And I say, no, I can't. I have to be sharp. And he said, do you ever drink after you're writing? And I say, yeah, I'll have a glass of wine after I'm done. He said, me too. And he said, why do you do it? And I said, well, writing nonfiction is such a disciplined thing that you're, you're really tense, focused. And I need a, a glass of wine to have me so I can relax. And I said, do you? And he said, yeah, I always do. And he, I said, why? And he said, because writing novels, it's such an emotionally voluble experience. I need to have a glass of wine so I could tighten up. <laughs> and so we both had a glass of wine, but completely opposite reasons. And that made me think that you know, novel writing is just pouring out something really deep inside, whereas nonfiction is getting the evidence right and lining it up. And uh, so that, that would, you know, the job we choose chooses, creates the person we become. And so I, I be, leaned off in one sort of mentality versus the other based on not a choice, it just happened. And I would say to people who are in the college here, I rarely meet people who choose their career. It just sort of happens. <laughs> it's just like you look back and think, oh, it happened. But there was rarely a moment of decision. You evolve into something following some interest or you get some opportunity and you follow the, you're like drawn like a beacon <laughs> to something. Um, it's interesting because I remember in college, somebody said, you know, don't get too focused on career. It was an advisor or a professor saying there, there were some statistic, people changed careers X number of times and so forth. So I've been Ever since I got to college, I've been a journalist, so I've been very, very fortunate and lucky in many respects. But I wanted to get back to just one thing, back to sort of to the nuts and bolts of, of writing what you do. I, I sort of characterize, you know, some opinion columnists as, you know, just sort of putting forth their opinion. But I mentioned, uh, and you discussed the, the research and reporting. I guess for the, maybe the students here, the, what's the importance of that as a basis to go forward as a columnist that, I guess... Yeah. Should, should they just jump into colonizing, or is it good to get that foundation? Yeah, it seems just an obvious question Yeah, to just me, opine. But. Don't do it. Don't worry about the facts. No, yeah. I'm just, um, I bet Dean and I talk about this tonight, but I'm going to give you my method. And I give it to my students, and I give it to my children, and none of them listen to me, so I'm sure that none of you will listen to me. But <laughs> I'll tell you how I do it. <laughs> so I have a very bad memory. Uh, and so I need to write everything down. And so I take notes, and... If there's a subject like that Beatles thing, I've got 850 words, but I will read everything I can. I'll get a couple books, and I will mark them up, and then I'll go to FedEx, and I'll Xerox off the relevant pages. And I'll have 250 pages of Xerox pages from a book, printed out from an article, notes I've taken to myself. And so that's done by Wednesday morning, say, or Wednesday afternoon. Thursday morning, I, lay, I take my big stack, and I lay it on piles on floor in my office. And every pile is a paragraph in my column. And so there might be 14 piles on the floor. So for me, writing is not typing into a keyboard. It's crawling around the floor with my piles and organizing them in the right order. And I tell my students, writing is traffic management. If you don't get the structure right, if you sit down to write it, it just won't work. And so by the time I sit down, I basically got the column done. I pick up the first pile, I write the paragraph, throw it away, pick up the second pile, write the paragraph, throw it away. And even each pile, I break that pile into piles, which is each sentence. And so it's a meticulous process of synthesizing and organizing information. And since my skill, the one thing I can do is synthesize lots of information, it's just a very laborious process of piles. Uh, and if I, start, if I look at my students' papers, they'll be like, going this way, and then they have a bright idea, and then they have another bright idea. But your writing should be in a straight line. Uh, and when I was an op-ed editor, I used to tell my writers, think of it like Shark Cathedral. <laughs> this was to intimidate them. You see the front of the church? That's the facade. It's got the whole universe in one view. That's your first two paragraphs. <laughs> Then you walk in the door and you walk straight down the aisle. And at each 
spot on the trip, you can look off and see little side chapels, but you're just going straight down that aisle. And then you get to the end of your column, and it's the transept of the church, light illumination from all directions. <laughs> it's a little intimidating, but the main point <laughs> is straight down the aisle. I had a colleague who was my mentor when I first came to the Times, named William Sapphire. He said, a column can you have there one point or three points, but not two points. I've stuck with one point. There's just one point. And by the way, if you write books, each book has one point. The End of History by Francis Fukuyama, that's just one point. Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, that's one point. Michael Lewis, The Big Short, these crazy outsiders who don't know anything upset the big banks and they figure it out while the big banks don't, one point. And so it's super important to figure out you're just your one point and everything else is a riff off that one point. Mm -hmm. um. You mentioned, uh, I'm jumping around a little bit, but about how um, you know, sort of the, the moral issues and moral questions are, are more important than politics in, in your these days. And obviously you touch on that in your columns. And uh, I'm thinking about the, the last one about democracy in the, the dark century. And you talk about how uh, there's sort of a moral underpinning to what's going on. And correct me if I'm wrong, I don't mean to be you know, wrongly interpreting what you're writing, but the way I understood you writing it, that um, democracy is, first of all, uh, the aberration historically and, and not the rule, and it's difficult to create, and it takes a lot to keep going, and that's where things are falling down. And a lot of that you point to not so much the leadership, but just people in general, that, that, that almost a, a little moral collapse and uh, you know, the, the weakness of institutions and even to... to pull that, to reverse that, it needs to almost come from the ground up. I guess the, the question is, how do you get at that in a larger sense to, to, to people that that is really what needs to happen? I mean, obviously writing about it, but... Yeah, I, well, you do it, um, hopefully it's, the problem with the newspaper comments is so short, it's hard to tell stories. But hopefully you can tell a story to capture a different view of human nature. In my view, all of our lives are built on an implied view of human nature. And there was an implied view, very common a century ago, less common today, which is we're all basically sinful. And we need a couple things to be safe from our own selfishness. We're all self-centered. We see the world from our viewpoint. And we think the world revolves around us. It's just the default position. And so one way to be safe from that, if you're religious, is God's grace redeems you. Uh, another way is to think, well, on my own, I'm pretty selfish, but if I can join an organization, an institution, that institution will train me to be a little less selfish. And so I might be a lazy, undisciplined lieabout, but I enlist in the Marine Corps, and they send me to boot camp, and they spend me four years of a Marine, and suddenly that institution has formed me to be more self-disciplined, stronger, and more together. And so I need an institution to form me. And, but that's all based on the idea that I'm, I'm insufficient in myself to become a good person. And I think that was a common view in American history for a long time. Uh, and it changed, you know, 50, 70 years ago. It was replaced by the view, we're all fundamentally good. We can trust ourselves. Institutions crush us. The sin is in the institution, not in ourselves. So we need to be free. Uh, and so freedom got redefined to absence of restraint. And if you think you're fundamentally good, then you're not going to be formed, and you're not going to defer to institutions like the Marine Corps to form you. And in my view, that will leave you adrift with too much faith in yourself. And so when our basic assumptions about what a person is shift, then the whole moral ecology of a society shifts, and the way we choose to live shifts. And I think we've, we've entered a, you know, I, I, um, I was driving home years ago, and I was listening to NPR, and on, in D.C. on Sunday nights, they have old radio broadcasts. And I listened to an old radio broadcast, I, it was, I can't remember what the show was called, it was a variety show in the 40s. And I happened to hear the episode that was broadcast the day Americans learned that Japan had surrendered. And so the broadcast went on about an hour or two after they learned they'd won the war. And the host was Bing Crosby. And he says, we've just learned we've won this war. 
I guess at a moment like this, we don't feel too proud. We're just humbled and we're just glad we got through it. And I was just struck by the tone of humility. So I, I'm amazed by that. And, and later in the, uh, that same broadcast, an actor, some of you may remember, Burgess Meredith, who was in Rocky and a bunch of other things, he reads this passage from Ernie Pyle, who was a great war correspondent. And he said, we won this war because we had a lot of resources, we had brave allies, we didn't win it because we're better than anybody else. We should just try to stay humble and be worthy of the peace. Again, incredible note of humility. So then I go inside, I turn on a football game, and I see a defensive back tackle a guy after a two-yard gain. He does what all professional athletes does. He does a big dance in honor of himself. And it occurred to me I'd seen a bigger self-puffing victory dance after a two-yard gain than I'd heard after winning World War II. And it struck me we'd moved from a culture of self-effacement, which says I'm no better than anybody else, but nobody's better than me, to a culture of look at me, look what I did. And that's a shift. And I don't want to say it's a shift from something really good to something bad. Because every shift you have wins and losses. But it's a different attitude about the ego. And it's much less self-suspicious about ego. So I went on, I saw this, and I went on to write a book called The Road to Character about humility. I was just interested in the virtue of humility. And that came out in 2015, and then 2016 happened. And I thought, well, I solved that problem. You know, got a lot of humility in national life. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yes, sir. So I didn't read that book, but I read um, The Second Mountain. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed that in the introduction, you acknowledged that you got a whole lot wrong with the book you'd just come out with. Which made me feel good that I didn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I just wonder if you could talk about that realization and whether that was a hard thing to do. Or if you've known any other public intellectual. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I it, I've had some second thoughts. I got some criticism, but you know we're all learning, and so we're all on a journey. Uh, and why write a book if you figured everything out in your last book? <laughs> like, and so the thing I got wrong was character formation. Like, how does character get formed? In the road to character, and I don't think it's completely wrong. It's self conflict, self. Uh, battling against your own weakness. So for example, one of the stories I tell in that book is about Dwight Eisenhower. He's nine years old. He wants to go trick-or-treating. His mom won't let him. So he throws a temper tantrum. He punches the tree in his front yard so badly he rubs all the skin off his fingers. You don't have to read the book now because I'm telling you one of the stories. Uh, and his mom sends him to a room, lets him cry for an hour, and then goes up to his room an hour later to bind his wounds and recites to him a verse from Proverbs. He that conquereth his own soul is greater than he who conquereth a city. And 52 years later, Eisenhower calls that the most important conversation of his life because he learned he had a problem. His problem was his temper and his anger. He was just an angry little kid. And he said, if I'm going to make something in my life, I've got to defeat my anger. And he spent the rest of his life trying to work on his anger. So even when he was a president or general in World War II, he was a hater. He'd lie up at night smoking and hating people. And he'd try to purge that, because if he was going to lead, he had to be positive and optimistic. So he'd write lists of all the people he hated in the middle of the night and rip them to shreds and throw them in the garbage can to purge his anger. And so the, see, if you study history and you see Dwight Eisenhower, this garrulous country club kind of guy, that was an artificial creation. He built that. And so that was my model of character formation. Find your key sin, defeat it. And I still think there's some virtue to that. But if, I don't know about you, I sometimes still, but I used to always make New Year's resolutions. And it was based on that idea. I've got to do some things, so I'm going to get some willpower and self-discipline, and I'm going to beat it. I don't think I've ever had a New Year's resolution come true. In my view, willpower is not strong enough to defeat our bad desires. You can only beat a bad desire by replacing it with a better desire. And so to me, the key to character formation is not defeating your will, it's educating your loves. Find a way to love something that's better than the things you used to love. It don't love booze, love your family. Uh, and so like when you have a kid, 
you normally you're when you have a kid you're you become aware of a level of devotion love you did not know existed and so gradually you want to you might used to want to go play golf on the weekend but you got to play with your kid and you generally like playing with your kid and so you take them to the playground and gradually you refashion your desires you become a little less selfish you became a little more loving a little more devoted to others and so to me the process of improving your character is the process of educating your emotions so you love the higher things and you become what you love so be careful what you love that's what augustine said love the right things if you love power you'll always feel weak if you love money you'll always feel poor but if you love beauty and friendship and relationship, then your life will sort of veer in that direction. So it's about, and, and basically what happened to me is what happens to a lot of people, get more emotional as you get older. And you get a little softer. And so you become a little more comfortable with talking about what you love. And I, when I pitched the second mound to my publisher, she said, oh, God, David's going through his woo-woo phase. <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> yes. um, can you give an example in your experience or someone you know where a column actually changed public policy or actually did significant influence? No. <laughs> So when I started this job, I thought I would get a call from the president, say, David, you know, I really thought X, but then I read your brilliant column, and now I think Y. That has never happened. <laughs> You're, I'm basically like a teacher, like we're like teachers. We hope we can share something that somebody will pick up on. A job of a columnist is not to tell people what to think. It's to provide a context in which they can think. Just to poke and prod and hopefully introduce this, some idea. But the object of policy, changing policy for a policymaker, I do, I mean, as a columnist, I'm fortunate enough, especially in DC, I get to go in the White House a lot and talk to powerful people. The one thing you should know about people in power is they are not learning. Henry Kissinger said this, you enter office with a level of human capital, you don't build it up when you're in office, you spend it down. They're just too busy. They don't have time to think. And so when you write a column, they're not thinking, what can I learn from this column? They're thinking, is he for me or against me? Is he helping me or hurting me? That's all they can think about. And so their job is not to learn from us. Their job is to get us to think like them. And if I can drop a few names. So especially in the early Obama administration, Obama and I had been close before and he had been a Chicago organizer when I was a crime reporter. Uh, and so I would write a column criticizing him. And I'd get a call at three in the afternoon. David, the president wants to see you in the Oval Office. Can you come over here? So I'd go over there and he'd talk to me for an hour. And then I'd write a positive column and I wouldn't hear from him. <laughs> then I'd write a negative column a couple weeks later. David, the president wants to see you. <laughs> so I would get to see him every time I criticized him. I said, Mr. President, you're setting up a very perverse incentive structure for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was never, I'm going to tell you something. It's, you know, I, I'm thinking when I'm writing of just not people in office. I'm thinking of people, just regular old, my friends and neighbors. Because I, I, the idea that uh, columnists are powerful in that way is just not true. Um. You know, touching, getting back to a little bit uh, on, on what you're talking about, the, the character issue, and that is part of some of your, your columns that, I, that I've read. It, throughout the whole pandemic, there's been, in my view, a real focus on the struggle in the country of, between individual freedom versus good, what's good for the community. And it's a balancing act, and we've seen it come into conflict quite a bit. I guess uh, what... It, is the pendulum swinging too much? Uh, it sounds sacrilegious to say too much in the way of individual freedom, but too much in the way of individual freedom at the expense of community good. Yeah, I think for sure. It's a small question. Yeah, no, I mean, to me, I looked at the air we breathe as a common property, and therefore masks seem like just protecting the common property or vaccines. And people say, aren't you impinging on individual freedom? I say, well, I stop at stop signs. 
Like, you know, we, we need stop signs if we're going to drive together. Uh, and, but I would say in general, uh, we've overdosed on individualism over the last 60 years. And as a result, if you leave people naked and alone, they're going to rebel against freedom. And there was a book called Escape from Freedom that Eric Fromm, a psychologist, wrote after World War II. And the question was, why did all these people in Weimar, Germany, where they had a lot of freedom, why'd they go for Hitler? And his argument was they had so much freedom, they were left naked and alone. And they wanted to escape from freedom into tribe. And so when Hitler said, follow me, we're part of the all one group, they said, sign me up. And in a much less serious way, I think we're doing the same thing. We had a period of ex extreme individualism. It was left-wing individualism in the 60s about lifestyle. It was right-wing individualism in the 80s at economic freedom. But it was all individualism. It was all the self. What the culture of narcissism, they called it, or Tom Wolfe, the me decades. And in the last 15 years, starting maybe around 2013, people said, to hell with that, I want a tribe. And they picked politics. And I remember I talked about in, in the early morality, the line between good and evil ran down the middle of each person. We had sinful side and good side. In the morality of politics, the line of good and evil runs between groups. My group is good, the other group is bad, and I feel righteous purpose, a sense of righteous purpose fighting for my group. And to me, we replaced a kind of individualistic anarchy with culture war, and neither is good. The psychologists have a phrase the hardest thing to cure is the patient's attempt to self-cure. You've got a problem, so you try to cure it with something, like alcohol. It's harder to cure that than the original disease. And to me, our tribalism is harder to cure than the original disease of excessive individualism. And now we're in this moment of, of group versus group. And we're, we're leaving the age of individualism, and now we're just having a big fight over what kind of group will prevail. Mm -hmm. That's sort of, oh, yes, please. Where do you think it's going? Yeah, well, right now, not in good directions. Uh, you know, our, our devotion to tribe, you know, tribe seems like community. But community is a mutual love for a thing. We love our town or our faith or whatever. But tribe is a mutual hatred for the other. And so one's based on an abundance mentality. There's enough for all. The other's based on a scarcity mentality. It's a zero-sum fight. And so we're spiraling in that direction. And I worry, I mean, I, there's a lot of things. I'm a ridiculously optimistic person. But, you know, there are lots of reasons to be concerned about America, that we're so tribal that we no longer trust each other. Uh, and social distrust has just plummeted in the last 50 years. Um, the, the, uh, the way I would say optimistic is that I w I've been, through the whole last few years, I've been given nourishment by a book I, that was written in 1981 called The Politics of Disharmony by a political scientist named Samuel Huntington. And he, he wrote in 1981, every 60 years or so, America goes through a moral convulsion, a period of disgust with established power, a new generation comes on the scene, people outside the system demand to be included inside the system, there's usually a new communications technology. He said this happened in the 1770s, Happened in the 1830s with Andrew Jackson and populism. Happened in the 1890s with Progressive Era. Happened in the 1960s with all that. And he says, he wrote in 1981, I don't know if the 60 year cycle really maintains, but if it does, some, somewhere around 2020, we'll have another moral convulsion. <laughs> I was like, pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> and so the good news about that is we come out of it. That you go through a period with a lot of turmoil, a lot of hatred, but people figure out a solution and you get a new culture. Like in the 60s, culture really shifted. If you went to the high school, local high school yearbooks here in 1965 and looked at the guys, they all had crew cuts. Then in 68, half the guys had crew cuts, half the guy had long hair. By 75, they all had long hair. <laughs> and that was the trivial thing, but really cult serious cultural shifts happened. Feminism, all, the, all sorts of stuff. And we built a new culture. And then we had a period where that culture lasted, and then finally it stopped lasting, and you chop it up, and you have to build a new culture. So the optimistic sense is that we're going to build a new culture. And so for right now, I would say, among the many things that are happening right now, we had a culture that was pretty white-dominated. And that just couldn't last. And so we've had a racial reckoning, 
Uh, and parts of it have been messy and parts of it have spawned a backlash and parts of it have been hard. But it's something we had to go through or have to go through. And I'm hopeful that we'll enter some new era where, it post, where the racial reckoning will still be ongoing, obviously, but we'll have made some steps thanks to uncomfortable and hard conversations. And I'm hopeful that we'll recover. And you know, I, I think about all the rhetorical violence around, but I had, I had a friend who taught at Cornell in the 60s. He said in 1969 or 71, there were like 4,000 bombings on campuses. You forget how really, all the assassinations, it was brutal. Then by 1974, every, all the kids were up in Monterey looking at crystals and Esalen and Est and doing new age stuff. It was like they got tired of being angry all the time and they sought out a new culture. So I'm a little hopeful we'll, we'll be all up in Monterey. <laughs> <laughs> And it seems like our reflection in America and the phase we're going through is, you know, well, freedom means I can do whatever I want, but yet, we, you know, we got people starving to death, we got people in Afghanistan that, you know, can't get health care, and uh, I think just kind of, what are your thoughts around kind of juxtaposing, you know, our Americanism with what's going on in a global context? Yeah. Well, first, one thing you learn being a foreign correspondent, which I was for five or six years, is we are not as big to them as we think we are. <laughs> that they're, they're having their country, and they're not thinking, well, what are the Americans going to say? They're like having their country. <laughs> and the other thing you learn is how different every culture is one from another. So I, I was in Afghanistan during the war, and we were talking about corruption. And... I didn't ask this, but I was around a table. Somebody asked one of the Americans, if you had a job and you gave it to your cousin, would you call that corruption? The American said, yeah, that's corruption. And he asked the Afghan guy at the table, what would you call corruption? He said, well, if I had a job and I didn't give it to my cousin, that would be corruption. The exact opposite, because they have a kinship-based society that they give jobs to their cousins. That's how it works. And so they just have a very different ethos than we have. And so being respectful of those cultural differences is just, to me, just the tremendously important. We make so many of our errors in foreign policy because we assume everyone thinks like us. And I can tell you Vladimir Putin thinks nothing like us. He thinks about the distinctness of the Russian soul. He sees Russia as part of this civilization stretching back centuries with certain rights and holy responsibilities. We just, you know, we just don't talk that way. I covered the end of the Soviet Union. I loved it, because we would be sitting in somebody's kitchen, drinking vodka, and in America we'd be talking about political maneuvering, but it, in Russia it was always the Russian soul. It was always Dostoevsky. <laughs> like it was never like the light bulb burns out. It's never like the light bulb burned out. It's like, no, the Russian soul is really diseased. And so they were, everything was super profound. I loved it. But it, they just have different ways of looking at things. And so that's one thing. It's just cultural difference. And one thing I learned over the last year is we think we're in a global world where culture is merging. Somebody did an analysis of music, of who, what kind of music people are listening to. People are listening more to their own nation's music than they used to. Cultures are actually diverging, not converging. And so it's important to my friend and colleague, Tom Friedman, wrote a book called The World is Flat. Maybe economically it's flat, but culturally it's not flat. It's really very different one place to another. And so that's one thing. And I should say, apropos of your question, I don't want to minimize economics and poverty and inequality. Culture is never separate from economics. There's this stupid debate where liberals say, no, we have to give people more uh, money, and conservatives say, no, we need better culture. The two are so intertwined, it's ridiculous to pretend there's any difference. Uh, I was up in South Central LA, uh, and I was inter investigating one question, which was, shown, which was shown to me by an economist named Raj Chetty at Harvard. 
he, he looks at where is there opportunity in America? And he had this paradox that in Compton, your odds of being in jail if you were an African-American male at 22 were 6%. If you were in Watts, your odds were 44%. So Watts and Compton are demography very similar. They're like two, three miles away from each other. So what the, what's the difference? Why Compton and why not Watts? So I went to Compton and Watts trying to figure it out. And the best I could figure was that Compton is its own city and Watts is a neighborhood of LA. And so Compton had all these civic institutions and neighborhood institutions. It was just a much denser, thicker society than Watts. And so it had advantages for gr people growing up there. But for both people who were poor, poverty is its own reality. And to say you have bad culture when you can't make rent, it's ridiculous. The culture, your culture is determined by the fact that you're moving every three weeks because you can't make rent. And so I always rebel against anybody who tries to distinguish culture from economics. The two are just so intertwined. It's just we live our lives to, as one thing, not bifurcated. And so I don't mean to minimize the power of wealth or poverty or inequality and all those other economic forces. Did somebody over here? Yes. Yeah, well, I'm exhibit A. People sometimes, occasionally I'll get asked, you know, we, when we look back at history, we can't believe some things they tolerated we, f we find completely barbaric. And people sometimes ask, well, in 100 years, what, what are the things we're doing they'll find barbaric? I have a feeling our treatment of animals will be high on the list. But I still order the steak. Um, and so I would not, um, if I were a campaign manager for a politician in America, I would not advise them to ban steak. I used to think we'd have um, lab-grown meat and all that kind of stuff. And I find the, the what's it called, the Credible Burger, whatever that thing is, I find it quite good, actually. Uh, I'm told the economics of some of the lab-grown meat don't make sense. I, I'm not an expert on this, but that's what I'm told. Um, the question is, are we going to change factory farming or the way chickens are raised? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I should be consistent and say, well, I'm going to become a vegan. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, if anybody has a better answer than I'm giving, I'd be grateful for it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I would hope so. I guess the question I would ask, and I don't know the answer, is can we do that and make the food affordable? So, like, there's a restaurant I go to in D.C., one of my favorites. I don't get to go there that often. But they tell you where each farm all the food came from. And it's like, you know, the beets came from this farm, and they were lovingly, they volunteered the beets to commit suicide so you could eat them. And and then the soil they were grown in, the soil was a special loamy fo soil. It was beautifully massaged every day. Uh, but that's an expensive restaurant. And I'm not sure Chick-fil-A is going to go, go for that. So I, I don't know. I, I would love to think we could have humane farming that's affordable. It, it's a business I don't know all that much about.
Absolutely good point. Yeah. yeah, that seems very fair to me. I, again, I'm not an expert in foreign policy, but because I cover politics, I cover the Iowa caucuses every four years. And when I first started doing it years and years ago, you drive through Iowa, there are a whole bunch of different crops. And then they just subsidized corn. And now it's just corn. You drive through the whole state, it's corn. And so you see the power of, of those subsidies. Well, just on that, I've seen some commentary about how we should do a moonshot on the lab-grown beef that for more so than, for, than uh, opposed to, or not, about farming and how we're treating animals, but for global warming, that that's right. a huge issue. So I, I think I sort of agree that is there a paradigm shift where subsidies start going to subsidize non-polluting or, or non-emission causing foods. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, there, did you have a question back there, ma'am? Well, I hear that the conversation has kind of gone away from this and it's about globalism. Uh, and it seems about 15 years ago there was a lot of talk about the importance of global warming. Uh, and then it Yeah, that's an excellent point. So when I was covering the end of the Soviet Union and all that, we thought borders were falling away. And the theme was convergence. Like the European Union all converged, like we're going to get rid of these nations, Italy, France, we're going to all be Europeans. And the West was going to be the West, and the East was going to be part of us, and everybody was going to merge together in one global system. And A, we were naive about how that would hurt a lot of people because you couldn't have American workers competing against Chinese workers, basically. Uh, and we were naive about how much people loved their own country and how different we were. Uh, and so I think one of the things we have to do is to um, learn how to appreciate the particular without making it hostile to the, un to the enemy. And so I, I'm a big Bruce Springsteen fan. And so somebody had said to me, you can't follow Bruce Springsteen unless you've seen him in Europe. So me and a bunch of buddies pooled our money and we went to go see him in Spain. And it's a totally different experience in my, in, if you go see Bruce Springsteen in America, the, I'm like the youngest guy in the audience. I'll be sitting at a Springsteen concert and the guy next to me will have his oxygen tank and his walker and like. <laughs> if you go in Europe, they're 21. He's got a gigantic youth audience there. And so we're at a stadium where Real Madrid plays in Madrid, gigantic stadium. And I walk in there, and all the kids have T-shirts with early Bruce Springsteen songs. So there, somebody will have a T-shirt that says The Stone Pony. That was a little bar where Springsteen used to play in Asbury Park. Or it'll be Highway 9, which is the highway that goes near his hometown of Freehold, New Jersey. Or Greasy Lake, a little lake near where he grew up. And how do these kids know these New Jersey landmarks? And then we're in the middle of this concert, which went on for four hours, by the way, uh, and 
in the middle, I watch over 65,000 screaming Spaniard kids singing, I was born in the USA, I was born in the USA. I was like, no, you weren't. (laughs) But the lesson was, when Springsteen, he had two failure albums. He had one big album that went big called Born to Run. The natural thing to do in his career was to go big and do this big superstar album. He could be a a global giant. Instead, he took four years off and wrote a small spare album about his little hometown called Darkness on the Edge of Town. It was very brave and it was absolutely the right thing to do because he anchored himself in a particular roots of his town, his people, his family. And he still spends his life thinking, I want to understand the people I grew up with. And so he's not global. He's very particular. And if you're a great artist and you're particular, the audience will enter your landscape and live in your landscape. If you read Faulkner, he wrote about it one county. And I don't know anything about Mississippi, but you read about that county. Or Pushkin or Tolstoy, they, you get, they've got their milieu. And so I think there's something really powerful and really good about that particularity. And if we try to bleach that away, we're really losing something. But if it becomes the Civil War, then of course, it's my county versus your county. And so the balance is to be rooted in the particularity of a specific culture without um, turning it into um, uh, xenophobia toward the other cultures. And xenophobia is a result of existential anxiety. When people feel safe, they assume the other is out to get them. And it's that lack of existential security that's one of our core problems. It goes by economic insecurity, emotional insecurity, moral insecurity. There's just a lot of insecurity right now. And, you know, one of the things I learned, I created this organization called Weave, traveling around the country, meeting people like those in Watts and Compton. And I was unprepared for the levels of trauma I found everywhere. And I used to tell my staff, who are mostly young, you have to remember, when I was growing up, they hadn't invented trauma yet. I don't understand it. You've got to help me deal with this. But the, the, the sense of lingering hurt by family problems, by racial trauma, political trauma, it's so pervasive in society today. I don't know if you've read this book. It's, on, it's been on the bestseller list, like at the top of the bestseller list for like 10 years, called The Body Keeps the Score. It's about how the body holds trauma. And it's big because so many people are experiencing that. And that you, I don't think you can think about our political situation, our social situation, without being aware of how many people are suffering from some kind of trauma, traumatic injury. Um, this might relate to that a, a little bit, but Dean and I were talking not long ago about um, you know, a, a common concern that, that about the level of public discourse and how low it is. I personally think that Frankly, it's always been low in different ways since you know the, the, the founders and their early political campaigns were as, as tough and misinformed and nasty as they get. But we've got the megaphones and the b- deep political divisions. Um, and you know, you talk about trauma, and I think a, a lot of people feeling hurt and angry uh, towards others. Uh, how how do we get from there to 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 encourage civil discourse among people that disagree? Almost violently. Yeah. I agree with you about the founders. I mean, like, yeah. my hero, I mentioned Alexander Hamilton. He was killed by the sitting vice president of the United States. Like, that's not civil discourse. <laughs> um, and, you know, in the 1770s, terrible. 1860s, mm-hmm. terrible. We've got, we go through these cycles, a little more civil, a little less civil. I think the problem now is that majorities don't rule. That most people, I think, are very capable of having civil conversations across difference. But in any organization, it's the people who are, I did this piece on the evangelical church, and one of the people said to me, it's about the brutal divisions in a lot of churches. And one of the people said to me, the spiritually most healthy people sit out these things. The spiritually least healthy people are the aggressors. And so the people who are the aggressors set the tone, and everybody else says, well, I'm not getting involved in that. And so minorities rule. And I don't quite know how we deal with that. I would say that there is a majority out there that believes in civil discourse that has moderate opinions and that, you know, people are uncertain, but they don't make it on Tucker. (laughs) Um, 
The, the other thing I say, I think there are organizations. I'm a big fan of an organization you can see online called Braver Angels, which helps get reds and blues together. And there are a lot of organizations, how do we cross divides? And usually it's a bunch of progressives sitting in the room saying we should cross divides. Well, they'd ever get any Trumpians in the room. Uh, but Braver Angels is half Trump, half non-Trump. And so they really work super hard on that. And uh, they're, they're organized by a couple people who were uh, marriage therapists and divorce lawyers. Okay. So they understand <laughs> this difference. And so they have all sorts of tricks to get them to, to actually talk to each other. So one of the tricks is, instead of saying, it, what, they ask people from reds and blues, what are the stereotypes people have about you? So that way they get the stereotype on the table, but it's not like me as a blue telling the red, here's what I think of you. It's the red saying, here's what I think you think of me. And so it's on the table, but they can converse about it. And they have these exercises they do together. And by the end of the third day, they're like, well, of course we get along, but the crazies are out there. They're not going to get along. And then the Brave Angels people say, you know, before we selected you for this, we went to social media and we found the crazies. You're the crazies. <laughs> and it turns out, and I found this in my own life, I read a column, I get savagely attacked by left or right, and this probably happened to you. You write an email back that's respectful, tone changes immediately. That's absolutely the truth. People just, you know, you break down that wall and uh, I have conversations via email of regular readers who don't agree with a lot of what I write, but they're they turn out to be reasonable, um, and we can agree to disagree. Yeah, so that gives you a little hope. Yeah, yeah. Yes? How has the pandemic <clears throat> impacted you as a, a journalist? Uh, so the pandemic has affected me as a journalist in one gigantic way, which is I, like now I'm on the road, but I went two years not being on the road. And so in 2015, I wrote 16 zillion columns with this subject. Don't worry, Donald Trump will never get the Republican nomination. <laughs> At that year, I was we're living in DC, teaching at Yale, working also in New York. So I was on the Acela for, you know, so how could I be out of touch with America? From the New York Times to Yale University. I've got America covered. <laughs> and so after that, I decided I should get out and founded this organization, Weave, and spent a lot of time moving from one, from one state to another. And I, most weeks, I was in three states a week and 35, 40 states a year. And if you're in McCook, Nebraska, you just get a different feel. Uh, and I, I ran to one guy in North Dakota. He was, this was, I can't remember when this was, but he loved Trump. And not only did he love Trump, everybody loved Trump. I think it was just before the election because he told me, obviously Trump's going to win. He's going to get like 90% of the vote because everybody he knew loved him. And so I said, why did you vote for him? Why are you going to vote for him? And he said, well, he is kind of a jackass, but let me tell you my story. And this guy was like 70. And he said, when I was 35, I had the best day of my life. I was forming at a plant that we made sort of the casings for refrigeration units that go on the top of office buildings. And he said, I was the foreman in my little section, and they replaced the equipment, and I was no longer qualified to be foreman. So they laid me off. And so I thought I'd gather my stuff in my box, and I'd put it in a box, and I'd just carry it quietly out to my car. I didn't need a big fuss. So he goes into his office, puts his stuff in his box, opens the door, and 3,500 people, the entire employees of the plant, have formed a double line between his office door and his car door in the parking lot. And he walks out carrying his box, and they're applauding him the whole way. And he said, that was the best day of my life. And he says, it's been 35 years since then, and every job I've had has been worse and lower paying. And my mother-in-law, who's in her 90s, is so sick, and we can't afford to really care for her, so we have to stay home. We've had to stay home every day for three years to care for her. And so I need to change. And so... I came away from conversations like that thinking Trump is the wrong answer to the right question. That there's real reason people vote for him, and I totally get it. Uh, and, but 
I would not s support him, but you just get to see the humanity and the complexity about why he exists and why he was elevated. And that face-to-face -face reporting is why we go into this business. Uh, and if we're just going to sit in a room behind masks and type into a keyboard for 18 months, it takes away most of the fun. And frankly, it's a lot harder to do your job because suddenly I'm in Twitter world. And I'm reacting to the world as if it, Twitter is the world. And when you can't travel, you can't help but doing that. And I really felt I was uh, really in an echo chamber during COVID. Anybody? It just spurs me to think about this, um, the fact that you two are actual reporters who love to get out and connect with the community, and yet this, the advent of 24-hour cable news, some of which, as I understand it, they don't actually hire reporters. If they do, they hire a, a, a talking head to come to sit and talk, but they don't actually send people to the county fair, like they don't have reporting, and yet this So as you know, two men who spend your life reporting, you know, what, what, I don't know what the question is, but what do we do about so much echoing and so much 24-hour news formation where Fox News or whatever network becomes the elder's friend, becomes the community they don't connect with, even before the pandemic? Um, you know, how do we support actual reporting of what's really going on by reporters like well, first, it's it's a lot cheaper to have talking heads. It's just cheaper. Like reporting takes travel and <laughs> takes time, um, and the el w the elders' friend point is a crucial point. I can't tell you how many friends I've had who think their mom or dad were kidnapped by MSNBC or Fox. And I heard about this years ago. Fox has this little Chiron on the bottom of the screen that says Fox News, and some people would turn on Fox at seven in the morning, keep it on till eleven at night, and so the Chiron would burn into their TV screen. So Fox had to move it around so that it wouldn't ruin their TVs. And I thought, oh boy, we're really in something. But so that's the negative side. The positive side, I'll turn it to you. In San Diego, well, A, you've got your paper, mm -hmm. but are there a lot of little websites that actually do reporting? And are there nonprofit journalism that does reporting here? Yes, there are. And, and there are very good ones. The Voice of San Diego has been around for, I think, 17 years, and it's was well Dean did a I think Dean did a story for the New York Times some time ago that they were the first of these nonprofit news organizations that they work off foundations and 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 uh, donations um, and they're very good they do a lot of investigative stuff there are also other I don't know if patch exists anymore but some community newspapers and it's sort of a different world I mean maybe I have a, a blindness and a bias towards San Diego but uh, it's actually way out in our little corner here. It's been quite a news town. We've had our, our scandals and issues on public policy that sometimes have been uncovered by journalism, but well covered. Um, and so I feel a, a sense of an optimism that local reporting can progress. The financing is still what it's all about. Uh, there's so much free content out there uh, that, that people get. Um, that's a whole different animal. They, we just don't have the kind of demagoguery that you see at the national level that you're talking about the, the elder's friend and, you know, that people just get that one sweeping perspective. Um, so I don't really, you know, I'm sort of rambling on here. I don't really have, have an answer, but I think that the more various forms of uh, journalism financing are explored, the, the, the better off uh, we are. But how we get from this balkanization from you know CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Fox, and I don't mean the, the balkanization, but just sort of a legitimate standard versus, I'm sorry, Fox just is illegitimate, and it's just a, a shame that it's called a news organization. That's just the way it is. But I try to convince somebody of that. Having said that, when I hear from people that I can tell are Fox devotees, Acknowledging their point of view, you know, David mentioned a very important thing that, you know, he'll get berated by somebody in an email, the response, and suddenly there's a difference. First of all, people are thrilled. They just don't think somebody like you or in a local level, me will respond, but also just acknowledging their point of view, disagreeing with it. But they're so used to, I think, that, uh, you know, immediate, 
you're an idiot kind of tone. Um, and I remember when Trump was on the rise, maybe it was after he was elected, not as eloquently as David did, but I remember talking to people why I thought that happened. And there was a lot along the same lines that the, the, the you know, people didn't under, they were so focused on what a, you know, character and jerk Trump was, they were missing the, what the right question was, and he was the wrong answer aspect to it. So I think that, that once you, it sort of gets back to that conversation we hope will occur not between a columnist and a reader, but just with that, but with people in general, that understanding that point of view uh, without the reflex reaction in such a negative way, I think goes a little bit. It's not going to solve everything, but that's a start. I find in general local, the local world in general is much better than <laughs> I, you know, I, I worked out of a Sacramento bureau, which I, which I truly loved. And I'd been involved in national conventions. That was great and fascinating. But uh, yeah, I, when I sort of got back and I deal with some national issues, but you know, they're like border issues, they're, they're local, but you know, it's a national issue. Uh, and I, I really enjoy doing that. Sorry to digress. Talking about um, another political president character, it's the 50th anniversary of the water break, uh, Watergate break-in, and you were back then um, reporting, and now we know a lot more, and a lot more has been revealed. Kind of compare and contrast what your observations and thoughts were back then to you know what yeah. we know and observe now of what we know. Yeah. Just to correct the record, I was 11 when what did happen. But you were writing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I actually came into politics the summer of 73 when they had the Watergate hearings on TV. I started watching those. I became fascinated. And... Um, I, I was rooting for the Nixon people. <laughs> I thought they were so cool. <laughs> but I think what happened then was we're still living with the legacy of it. So if you asked people in 1920 or in 1965, can you trust government to do the right thing most of the time? 80% said, yeah. Imagine living in that world. And it didn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. Generally, government, you know, they build roads, they win wars, pretty good. They've passed the New Deal. And then from 1968 to 74, it goes from 80% to 30%. And we've, now we're at 19%. And the two big things were Watergate and Vietnam. And so people took a look at those things that had a seismic effect that we've never recovered from. And the other thing that comes to mind, I find Nixon an utterly fascinating figure, never met him, but one thing I learned was once you have a feeling of an outsider resentment, you never overcome that. It doesn't matter if you become president of the United States, you still think those Harvard bastards are looking down on me. And I think he was largely eaten up by that resentment and allowed it to poison a lot of things. If there's a question over there. Right. Right. And I mean, I know that the, the fabric of our nation has changed a bit. Like, there's obviously different demographics now than there were in 1920 or 1965, but we still weren't a nation of pure white people in 1920 and 1965. Right? Yeah. Like, who are we after? Yeah. So I, I've asked that very question. And African Americans still trust the government more than white people. I've uh, seen more benefits, maybe, from civil rights. The big difference is that. Is not an institutional trust. Do you trust the government? Who do I trust in society? And if you ask people, at all, not just African Americans, all sorts of disadvantaged groups, but sort of oppressed groups, they tend to be less trusting of the broader society, but extremely high trusting of each other in their community. And so if you talk to African American women, they say, in our neighborhood, each kid is a shared project. We're all raising that kid together. And so there's a tighter sense of community, but distrust for legitimate reasons of a lot of outsiders. And so when you look at low distrust groups, and the three lowest distrust groups, uh, in, interpersonally, not about government, are poor whites, young people, and African Americans. And they, their distrust is earned distrust. 
they've been treated badly, and they have a realistic view of the world. And so, but, but intense loyalty within themselves. Like, we have a lot of people in Millennial or Gen Z. Here, I, one of the things I've learned is that people in Millennial and Gen Z, one of the things they really love is when people of my general, generation make generalizations about them. <laughs> they love that. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of generational distrust right now. Like, what do you guys do about global warming? Or racial justice? Like, where were you? You were, you, like, I'm a little too young for the 60s, but you were preaching love, equality, and harmony. And so you moved to Santa Monica. Congratulations. And then you put up zoning regulations so nobody else could live around you. And so there's a lot of legitimate distrust about that. Um, and so uh, the point is, when you t we talk about distrust in society, it generally reflects the moral trustworthiness of society. It's not perception, it's reality. Uh, and so uh, that's what makes me concerned. Oh. Um, could I ask you to uh, have this discussion with regard to urban versus rural? I saw an article in the last week or so where they were talking about uh, rural is almost, you know, very highly percentage Republican and urban is highly percentage Democratic. So there's that divide within society too. With your travels, what do you observe about the moving towards the well, it's just a fact where I live in D.C. or where I grew up in New York or probably here or in L.A. or let alone San Francisco, it's 90% Democratic. We, progressives really cluster. And in rural America, it used to be divided. But now I maybe read the same article. It was a group of rural Democrats, and they said the Democratic brand is so poisoned they can't even wear a bumper, put on a bumper sticker or a lawn sign. It's the hatred is so visceral. And so it's not America, it's the whole Western world. We have this intense rural-urban divide. And my explanation for that is to blame my own social class. So I wrote a book called Bobos in Paradise about bourgeois bohemians, who are people highly educated progressives who live in the cities or in metro areas. And I'm one. And we basically grew up in the 60s. We thought we were going to be hip and, and egalitarian, so we built Whole Foods and anthropology because we thought we should name our clothing stores after an academic department. Uh, and, and so we created this, you know, fancy homes with slate shower stalls and nubby fabrics. And then we married each other and we invested in awesome amounts of money in our kids so they could go to competitive schools. And then they married each other and they invested more in their kid Somebody did a book on how much do college educated parents invest in their kids? The sum total is $10 million per kid. And if, if there's another stat that the average college educated couple spends $5,000 per kid per year just on extracurricular activities, travel soccer. Well, the rural America, or the, frankly, the bottom 80% can't compete with that. So every generation we get a little more segregated off Brahmin class of educated people. And people in our class, along the coasts mostly, but not only, control the universities, the culture, the media, the government institutions. And this is not just America. This is Europe. This is Germany. This is Italy. This is UK. And the people in the rest of the country, 80% say, those people have too much power. And by the way, they look down on us. And by the way, they keep us out of their schools and neighborhoods. And screw them. <laughs> And to me, that's, there are a lot of driving factors for why we're so divided, but that's one of the driving factors. And I think we have to change the way we select to get into expensive schools. And what am I talking about? I go to Yale, I teach at Yale. But um, we need to change the zoning regulations. We need to change a bunch of rules. Like there are a lot of industries like my industry. The way to get a job at my industry is you have an in unpaid internship. Well, who can afford to do that? And just a million barriers. And I think that's at the core of our urban-rural divide. Uh, and it's hard to see us changing much. And I got this, you know, I, I learned a lot of this theory by talking to Hungarians and Austrians, and they're doing the exact same process. So that's to me, is the, one of the divides. It's a class-cultural geographic divide that's what 
one British writer called it somewheres versus anywheres. There are some people who are anywhere. We can travel around and be comfortable. Some of them are planted. They're somewheres. They, they were born in McCook, Nebraska. They're going to die in McCook, Nebraska. And that's just a big cultural difference. Would you thank Michael and David? Uh, <laughs> thank you, David.